Hello, this is Steve Fretson, and I recently had the pleasure of interviewing Tony Nashar, Managing Director of Posenelli Chicago Office. Here are some of the highlights from my interview. Describe for me your legal background leading up to your current role at the firm. Well, I, I started as a general business attorney and uh, with a small firm out in the suburbs of Chicago. And I really had a diverse uh, experience uh, and, and was benefited by that because I handled litigation for business owners. I handled transactions for business owners and contract review and, and deals. Uh, from there, I progressed uh, to a little bit larger scenario with uh, a couple of colleagues of, of mine, and, and we built a, a small firm. Um, but my clients gratefully grew, and the resources that I needed to service them likewise grew. And so I found myself in a position to either look for additional <laughs> colleagues with the experience, whether it be transactional or more sophisticated litigation needs, or frankly join a bigger firm. And, and I ended up joining a bigger firm in 2006 with my six lawyers in Chicago. We, we joined Pulsinelli. Okay. Terrific. Terrific. And do me a favor and compare the legal industry today from maybe 10 years ago. What's What are some of the biggest changes you've seen? Well, Bluntly, technology has made uh, the business much more uh, responsive. Well, it, it's had benefits, I would say, because the resources that you have through technology are vastly uh, more significant than they were 10 years ago. But the burden, and, and it can be a benefit, but it's, it's a burden to uh, the expectations of response time and um, delivery of service have accelerated rapidly. And, and I do uh, attribute that to the technology. I could also say blame that on technology, but it, you know, as long as you adapt to the fact that that's the reality, then it can be a benefit as well. Okay. I mean, do you find that um, attorneys have a difficult time of setting appropriate expectations with regards to responsiveness? I do, uh, and I'm guilty of that just like many other people are. I think there's probably people that are very, very good at it. Uh, but setting the, the client's expectations either in time delivery mm -hmm. or in the uh, cost of service delivery is an important function, and you have to evolve and, and understand how to be better at it each time you're asked by the client, how long is this going to take and what's it going to cost, because right. they all do that now. Right. They're very interested in understanding what's going on before it happens. Right. Yeah. When you think about challenges that are facing law firms today and, and individual attorneys that are trying to build a practice and, uh, and make it. Uh, in, a, in a heavily competitive marketplace, what do you what do you think are some of the challenges that that you're seeing, whether it's within your firm or just out there in the market? Uh, I would say, simply keeping up with client expectations. Uh, the technology advances that we've had in the last ten years, and thirty years since I started, uh, have only accelerated client expectations and a professional. Uh, whether it be a lawyer, an accountant, an engineer, has to keep up with that. And so that's a challenge. And, and as long as you can continue to better yourself and understand the technology and what it can do for you, then you can be of service and you can deliver uh, your legal services as expected by the clients, even though you might believe that those are unreasonable expectations. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, with regards to um, mistakes that attorneys are making that you're seeing um, out there, maybe within the firm or outside of the firm, uh, what are some of the things that, that some of the mistakes that you're seeing that with, is they're trying to build a successful practice? Well, um, uh, not to repeat myself, but you know, except for doing the work in the time it's expected at the value, you, you've got to understand that despite these challenges of, of delivering almost immediate uh, responsiveness, uh, building the client relationship, 
isn't anything that happens immediately. You don't <laughs> ever meet somebody on the street and the next day they're in your office asking for, hey, can you handle this million dollar merger for me? That doesn't happen. So despite the, uh, the service delivery expectations, which are immediate, the building a client relationship is a time-consuming and uh, lengthy process. Can you do me a favor and get a little more specific with that? If you've got a, a potential client that you're that has a million dollar, you know, opportunity, and, and you and you you know that you could be of great service to that person, what are some of the things that you would do to try to move that relationship forward? And it's not fake. It's just it's just you need to build a relationship. There's right. time involved. If you know the business they're in, and if you're with a firm that delivers informational e blasts or or. Uh, you have a memo that's relevant that's not somebody else's work product in terms of, you know, has another client's uh, labels all over it. If you deliver uh, some timely advice to them about, you know, changes in regulations or uh, some economic news that may be relevant to their business, whether the business is banking or trucking or... Uh, ball bearings. Okay. If you're delivering them something, maybe it's something you saw in Wall Street Journal, um, and you think it's a topical article that maybe they read it that morning, but the fact that you sent it over to them in the afternoon and said, hey, this might be of interest. I think that that's an appropriate um, relationship building okay. exercise. They see that you're thinking they, about they them. They see that you're thinking about them, and you're not doing it to, to bill uh, an hour right. or even a quarter hour. Okay. You're, you're doing it because you know them a little bit yeah. or, or a lot, and you know what they care about or should be caring about, and you're exercising hopefully good judgment in sending them something that's topical to their business. And if you do that, then you're going to build a relationship. And they're not going to necessarily think of you the next day, but they may think of you a month later or even a year later. And, and you know, I've had relationships with people that um, they can be years. It could be two, three years to develop into a transaction. Um, but it's certainly rewarding when it does. And if it doesn't, that's okay, too. You, you've got to be patient. It's not always a one-for-one. One. Sometimes you got to give two or three pieces of advice or, or wisdom or uh, connect them to something that's relevant to them okay. before you get one opportunity back. And, and you can't be counting, well, hey, I sent you that article, so you got to send me some business. Right. That's not how it works. And, and people can get uh, lost in that and believe that, well, I'm not going to talk to them anymore because they never sent me any business. That's not how you it's not how you think about it. Right. It's a long-term process. So. Okay. So we got we got to kind of you got to stay in the pocket a little while and you got to you got to keep that keep keep the heat on, you know, yeah. in, in, in in a genuine way and um, hopefully be relevant. And be relevant, sure. Yeah. Okay, great, great. So let me ask you this, when you think about um, business development um, and how important it is to many attorneys today, um, what is what is one thing that you commonly uh, talk about with the with people in your firm about? If you could give one tip, what would that be? Whatever you're passionate about, get involved in that because what you will do is you will broaden your horizon of relationships. Okay. And you're not doing it to get business. You're doing it because you care about this thing. And you're developing relationships naturally out of something that you have passion for and if you do that then you'll be recognized as potentially that professional that cares about things beyond just billing the hours um, and people will rely on you and and it may be the CEO of some company or the CFO of another company or their spouse who happens to be on the board with you as you elevate up whatever this uh uh, other civic or community-minded um, 
organization is. So I, I, okay. I do tell people to get involved in things like that. When, when they when they do get in, because I people come to me with the same with with that similar thing, and I'm involved in this in this charity or this nonprofit, or I'm on a board, uh, and they always ask me, you know. But I'm not really, you know, I'm doing it because I care, but I also would love to see if I can get some business out of it or some connections out of it. Steve, what do you recommend, you know, I do to kind of ramp that up a little more quickly because I've been on it for two years and I really sure. haven't seen anything. Sure. Is there anything that you that comes to mind as far as that you recommend? You know, I, I would I would caution patients, but, of course, this is not a patient business all the time, so you have to sometimes do a little extra. Um, you know, find ways to connect with someone who is in your uh, capability. Okay. If it's a, if you're a banking lawyer and you're on a uh, animal rescue organization with uh, one banker or banker's wife and and you know three uh, manufacturing company owners, uh, well then concentrate on the banker and and maybe engage in a little. Um, dinners or lunches or ask them about their business a little more express sincere interest in what they're doing and what their their bank might be doing and from there I think there'll be you'll, you'll have a catalyst to take it to another level as opposed okay. to um, you know offering but, but it sounds like you're maybe in those situations you could single out individuals where you have some natural affinities or some commonalities right. with them, and those are the relationships that you maybe advance a little more quickly, going to a game or having drinks or having a business conversation or something where you're building that rapport maybe a little more quickly because you see that there's, there's more common footing. ground and there's common footing in business as well as the passion for that particular charity. Right, and and so I use that example of a banker because that's what I do. But right. but let's say there's an individual who's a uh, he's an executive of a pharmaceutical company. Bluntly, I don't know anything about pharmaceutical companies, but half a dozen of my colleagues in this office are pharmaceutical IP lawyers. Mm-hmm. So maybe I offer to go, hey, uh, Mr. CFO of X Pharmaceuticals love to go to a game with you with my colleague Teddy. Oh, that's, that's great. And yeah. and that creates that connection for a potential dialogue for a future business opportunity. Okay. Maybe because it's some IP protection issue that they have or something else. But you've, you know, also bring, bring your colleagues. Okay. Uh, don't be overly insular. I mean, that's a that's a personality trait. I mean, some people are just insular, and you're not going to break them. Right. Uh, others are more inclusive, and 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 will do that. I like to think I'm one of those people. But, okay. Well, bring, I'll bring. You know, hey, I've got a. Let's have a, let's have a uh, party. Without, without, <laughs> uh, you know, we've got a lot of tools in this tool shed, and so bring the right tools to the to the uh, transaction. Right, that's great. So, yeah, bring the right tools. If you've yeah. got uh, particular people that you think are going to fit well with with some of your connections, make sure you include them in the in the, uh, in, in the mix in the social engagement, or get them connected to this uh, if if you can, whether it be by a sporting event or a dinner or some other engagement outside of the board involvement. Let's say. Okay. Listen, last question for you, and, and that is, what advice would you give an up-and-coming attorney who's looking to build a successful practice? What are some of the things that you, have, you know, you're talking to a, a budding young attorney or maybe it's someone that's kind of midway through their legal practice, but they're looking to make a, a commitment to building a practice? What, what type of advice you would know, you give? You know, we all have expectations. Uh, even guys 30 years out of law school have expectations of them by their colleagues and their firm and the firm management. But, uh, and, and maybe I'm a little more comfortable understanding what those expectations are, and so I, I you know, pursue opportunities uh, at the same time trying to meet the expectations. But I think young lawyers have uh, possibly... Too much focus on, you know, I, all I can do is be here and bill, and and that's that is a pressure, 
and and they're going to have you know 10 20 and 30 year lawyers putting those pressures on them mm-hmm. but you've got to make some time to get out and interact with people whether it's just going to lunch whether it's going to see a game at the local tavern whether it's uh, getting involved in a board somewhere but the key is make time away from your desk okay. and and you know start with committing to I'm going to go out to lunch twice this month with folks that I went to law school with who are now in house somewhere or lawyers who are in a smaller firm where they may need some larger capabilities or if you're in a smaller firm you're going to make relationships with guys in larger firms because they would refer things down to you Um, maybe it's a client that they aren't equipped to handle because of well it's it's not going to be a large engagement so go go talk to bob he's got a he's with a firm of seven lawyers and they do just what you need Um, okay and it would be a just would be the service for you to think we can handle this economically. Okay. I mean, it sounds like two different things that you're saying. One is, you know, baby steps. If you're if you're getting into business development as a part of your practice, you don't think you have to go and you know win the world over in a day. Right. You can you can go to two lunches a month and you can start with some baby steps to kind of get going with it. Absolutely. Which which I which I agree with. Again, depending on your urgency to grow and, and how much yeah. you you can really do. And then the other piece of it is is don't be afraid to start looking at knowing other people in your firm and looking at cross-marketing opportunities because even if you have a specific focus and you're meeting people that aren't aligned with that, you know, think about the right tool in your toolbox. As you said earlier, right. there may be a better person to, to help move that relationship along. Right. And you've yeah. become a facilitator, but by and large, you're going to be credited with facilitating that. And, and the client will be appreciative and, frankly, your colleague will be appreciative, too. This concludes the interview with Tony Nashar with Posanelli. I'd like to thank him for his time and great secrets and tips, and we'll look forward to talking with him soon in the future.